All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Chi Chong Lee from uh, Professor Hayden Taylor's group at UC Berkeley. Uh, today, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, computer axial lithography, which we believe is the next paradigm of 3D printing. And um, just a disclaimer, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of my group, and then this is not uh, my project. But um, today, I want to talk about uh, a few things. So first of all, where does the computer actual lithography, where the cow technology stand in the uh, field of 3D printing, and also talk about how it works. And lastly, I will finish uh, with our development roadmap. What are we looking forward to uh, study, and how we are going to push it forward? First of all, so in, there's a number of uh, different 3D printing technologies, as you may know, and there's one interesting way to classify those, all those technologies by the dimensionality of the printing process. So currently, most of the, almost all of the 3D printing uh, process is serial in principle. So for a serial D process, we are processing one point at a time. For example, we have a FDM or SLA printer. We are just processing one point at a time, and we scan through the whole volume. And then for 1D technology, we are scanning a line at a time. And then, for example, we have a array of nozzles for inkjet printer. We have an array of nozzles, and that process a line at a time and scan through the entire volume. And then we move forward, then get the 2D technologies, which process uh, entire plane at a time. For example, you, you know there's a DLP. Uh, technology and also the carbon 3D. Uh, it's, you can say it's almost two and a half D because there is a continuous layer, but they are still processing one layer at a time. But the topic of the day is volumetric addit additive manufacturing. What I mean by that is that we process all the points of the object simultaneously in parallel. And the entire, you will see the entire object will form together in the container. What exactly I mean by that is something like a Star Trek replicator. You will see the part form inside the, uh, the volume of inches. We really want to develop these uh, technologies to do away with all those drawbacks of serial additive manufacturing. For example, um, you have a low throughput in some of the technologies, like it takes hours to print. And also because of this constraint of the pro uh, process, you have build failures, and then you have to iterate on your design, and then your printing parameters to deal with all those issues. And then again, uh, you also have support materials that you need to remove afterwards. And lastly, you might get a rough service. So we try to develop this volumetric additive manufacturing technologies to combat all those uh, drawbacks. So before I uh, talk about how our system works, I want to show you how it looks like first. So for example, uh, let's say I want to print this sculpture, the Finker sculpture in our system. That is how it looks like. You can see the timing on the uh, left-hand corner. And then you see the part form inside the volume simultaneously in just 50 seconds. So this is the fastest uh, 3D printing technologies known to date. And this is the exact same reason we draw me to the uh, Professor Taylor's group. And um, how does it compare to other technologies, right? You might ask. So for COD process, if you want to print a thinker, it may take you two hours. And then for 1D process, you have a slightly shorter print time. And then again, in 2D, even uh, shorter. But once you get to 3D, you can get down to one minute of print time. Right? This is game changing. And this is it's fast. You don't have to uh, add any support materials. And the technology itself is inherently layerless. Then you, then you might ask, how does it work then? Um, the principle is really similar to computer tomography you see in the hospital. In computer tomography, you have a person sitting inside a machine, and then you, uh, the machine will scan the uh, patients at many, many different angles and synthesize the three-dimensional image in the computer. That's, that's why how they call it, call it computer axial lithography. 
because the image is synthesized inside the computer. Our technologies is actually utilizing the same principle, but we call it computer axolithography. It's by superimposing all the projections uh, into the same volume. And then the resonance itself, we record all those proje projections and then accumulated this optical dose, and then the material that receives a really high optical dose will convert. Those that are underexposed, you can wash away. I, I can show you more clearly with the following video. So let's say we are printing a thinker over here, and then we calculate the projections required at any given angles. After we have this stack of images, we, form, we make it uh, in form of video and load it to the projector. We play this video, and then while we rotate the container in synchronous, such that after 50 seconds, you will see the entire part form in this container. So again, what the benefit of this uh, technique is that all points are forming simultaneously. And then you can just drain away uh, the unexposed or underexposed material, and then you will have your part. Again, here's our setup, uh, how our setup looked like. And then uh, these are the projections you will load to the projector. Then you might say, oh, uh, then how do we calculate those projections? How does it actually work? What's the inner working of it? So even though this technique is inherently volumetric, it doesn't have uh, any slicing. But I will just take one slice as an example. So let's say we are co uh, focusing on this slice of the thinker, and you will see this pattern. The way you calculate the projections is like you draw a line. Let's say you draw a line parallel to this R vector. And then you project all points to that plane. Then you will get projections for one of the angles. Okay? And then you again, and then you construct another plane and then project the points again. And then you get another projections. You do this for all possible angles, and then you get you get uh, all the possible projections. And this is what we call mathematically a way down transform. It's the same transform you use in the CT scanning. And after, afterwards, if you recombine all those projections, you will see a synthesized image like this. But this is not good enough. The contrast itself is really low because um, there's an inherent limitation on, um, on this concept is that we cannot project the negative intensity. In the computer tomography, you can uh, use signal processing to process the image to achieve a higher contrast, just like you do with Photoshop. But here, we cannot project uh, negative intensity. So we have to play with what we have. We can, but we can optimize the projections such that we can get a higher contrast in the, uh, at the end of the volume. So to, in summary, uh, we have to compute the projections from all different angles. And then we project it to the volume of interest while rotating it. And then you can get your parts in 50 seconds. You take out the part. Uh, and then you can do post-processing on it. If you want like, um, stronger material property, you can do post-curing or other reinforcement. Or you, if you want color, you can paint it. You, uh, then you might ask, oh, uh, can we actually get opaque objects just white out of the print? Yes, we actually we can. So the, the way you do it is to you adding a dye in the volume to color it. Uh, you just have to, uh, the dye itself just uh, doesn't absorb the wavelength the, of the light you are patterning. Let's say you are patterning with UV. If the dye doesn't absorb UV, it's fine. You can be completely opaque in the visible range, and, and yet you can still get your object. So it really looks like a Star Trek applicator, replicator, and then you can see like uh, my colleagues here printing a like a glass uh, container, just like in the movie. So um, you might ask, oh, what, oh, then what are the geometrical capability of the techniques? Almost limitless. So we tried uh, to print uh, octet structures, which is fairly complex. 
And then we have feature size down to 300 microns, 0.3 millimeters. And then we also try to print hollow structure and some organic dental models. Another advantage of this technique is that you can achieve a really smooth finish. If you print in hydrogel, if you print a sphere, you can see it's like optically smooth. So in the future, it, we can use this technology to print optics. And again, um, because we don't need any support structure, it's inherently, uh, the object inherently is robust against gravity. So we can print really soft tissues for bioprinting. We try to use uh, gelatin mefaculate and then print uh, quite a few structures. As you can see here, the finger printed in gelatin mefaculate is so soft, it can collapse under its own weight. But that is the uh, stiffness required in the bioprinting industry. And again, another, uh, another advantage of these techniques is overprinting. As you might know, how, how a screwdriver is manufactured, right? It is a, they use overmolding, uh, which is you put a piece of metal inside the mold, and then you mold plastic over it. This is a variant of injection molding. We don't have any analog technique, any equivalent technique in the 3D printing world. But now we have it. We call it overprinting. First, we put embedded an object inside the volume, and we can print over it. This is the screwdriver microworker as print to demonstrate this capability. Uh, to, in summary, um, this technique has a number of uh, fabrication advantage. Of course, first of all, it's the fastest technique in the market. And I, I shouldn't say market because it's not commercialized yet. And, um, and also, it doesn't have any support material. You can just get your net part. And then you have a smooth finish. You can print in soft material. And you can do overprinting to embed functional um, maybe functional parts like electronics inside it. And lastly, we can use really high viscosity resins. That's not possible in other techniques like SLA or DLP technologies. They may have hydrodynamic limitations that prevent them to use high viscosity resins. And last but not least, so uh, because these techniques, uh, you, in this technique, you just have to drain all your un underexposed material. You can reuse the resins afterwards. So um, you might ask, oh, how we are going to push this forward? This is amazing technologies. And what are the goals that we currently have? First of all, on the material side, we try to develop biocompatible materials for bioprinting, of course. And then um, in terms of geometrical limitations, we want to achieve a multi-wavelength control. We want to control, have more control on cross-linking and local properties. In the future, probably we can beat the defection limits to get even finer features, or we can print graded, functionally graded materials. Third point is that we want to print uh, in block material properties, such that you get an end user part, is that you don't have to do any post-curing afterwards. And of course, last but not least, we are also interested in uh, printing functional materials like ceramics. And on the other hand, um, on the resolution and scalability, we target, uh, we aim to achieve a sub 100 micron resolution in the future, and also uh, get to uh, up to 50 centimeters of build volume. On the algorithm side, uh, we want uh, the algorithm to support overprinting on arbitrary uh, embedded components. And also, we want to take into account of absorption and property gradients in our algorithm so they and, and allow us to fine tune the material properties inside the uh, part. We are looking at applications in printing vascular structures in bioprinting. And also, we want to print optics with our optically smooth surface, of course. And one of our students actually looking, uh, looking forward to in apply these technologies in road-to-road -road system in printed electronics. So this is our, our team that worked on this project. And uh, we do invite uh, industrial and academic collaborations, particularly on the material development and uh, application demonstration. For if you have any interest on uh, collaboration, please contact my professor, Professor Hayden Taylor, at this email address. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I can probably answer it here if we have time. Yeah, we have time. OK. Thank you, Mr. Chi Chung Lee, for showing us that impressive new
technology. Are there any questions regarding this topic? Yes, sir. So actually about the resin uh, recovery that you mentioned, because you're always exposing all the resin in the vat, basically, and it's partially cured, essentially. Is there, can you reuse it in the same process, or are you going yes. to get like, some issues where some parts get overexposed? Then? This is uh, actually a question like, people usually ask. But how can you just reuse the resins if the light passes through it? Right? So in fact, um, we use oxygen inhibitions in our process. I didn't talk about it in details because we don't have time now. But uh, basically, uh, what the material do most of the time is that when it's subject to light, we are trying to e deplete the oxygen, which inhibits the polymerization process. Once the oxygen is depleted, we can initiate the reactions really fairly quickly. Okay, so most of the time, when when most of the time the material is spent in depleting the oxygen, basically our material is not changed except the oxygen level. Okay, so after all, after the printing, you drain uh, the container. You get the resins. Basically, if you heat it at 60 degrees for one hour, let the oxygen to re-equilibrate, to diffuse in back, back into the material, then you can reuse the resins without problem. So we actually tested it. And then um, the, using the brand new resins and also reuse the resins, uh, basically the structure that we print is essentially the same. Good question, by the way. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Well, I think I got a question too. Um, okay. Is it, well, just a second. Um, is it possible to scale up the build chamber? Yes, like, yes. This is definitely what we are looking at right now. So uh, one of the limitations currently uh, bottleneck we have is the penetration depth of the light. So. In order to initiate reaction, we need to add photo initiators, right? Those photo initiators is what give the resins the yellow color. It absorbs the blue light that we use the pattern. And then if the blue light cannot penetrate all the way through the container, then you can say, like, it, it will not work, right? So um, the key to achieving a large B volume is to fine tune the concentration of the photo initiator, the sensitizer itself, such that it's enough to initiate the reactions, but not to have something too strongly such that the light attenuate in the middle, attenuate too much in the middle of the volume. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for your yes, great question. presentation.